Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher live show with myself, Shannon Crow. Today we're going to dive into pranayama or breath control or breathing. So this is a great video if you're a yoga teacher, a yoga student, or a person who breathes. Let's first start by starting with the breath that will actually help me because I get a little bit nervous doing a live show. So let's start with a breath practice that will bring a little more calming to the nervous system. So we're gonna inhale together and exhale together and see if we can make our exhale a little bit longer. So I'm gonna use my hands just so you can visualize where my inhale and my exhale are, but I want you to find your own breath rate with that. So inhaling and exhaling. Each inhale, filling up the lungs. Each exhale, really lengthen the exhale. Let's see if we can make the exhale a little bit longer than the inhale. Taking two more deep breaths. I'm gonna leave my arms relaxed down to my sides and see what it's like to really still focus on that inhale and the lengthening the exhale. So welcome to all of you who are joining today. If you have any questions as we go along, um, it'd be great if you type in the comments and then I'll come to the questions at the end of the show. It's great to see that you're here, Chris, and that you're taking in some of the sunshine today. So we're gonna talk about breath. What happens when we breathe? I'm gonna talk a little bit about belly breathing and my journey with that and then the benefits of breathing and pranayama, and we'll get into just touching on core breath, and we'll do a little bit of practice with that as well. So what physically happens when you breathe? First of all, let's start with the rib cage. So let's bring hands to the rib cage and feel the rib cage. If you can bring thumbs back behind and fingers in front, you're gonna see if you can expand your ribs on the inhale. and let the ribs come back together on the exhale. And continuing with this breath. Good, you can keep with that if you want as I talk through what's going on in the body. So that's what starts the, I mean, I don't wanna say that's what starts the inhale it's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg, but we're gonna start there today to talk about the inhalation at the rib cage. So the rib cage, oh, something's happening here with my video. I hope that it's working. If it's not, let me know in the comments. Okay, so we have the inhalation and the exhalation. So the Ribs are expanding on the inhale and then they're relaxing on the exhale. That is what then moves the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is this dome shape and on the inhalation, it's gonna move down. And on the exhalation, it's gonna move up. So that's what's happening with that, with the diaphragm. The pelvic floor I'm gonna back up a little bit. We're gonna do a little visual here with the pelvic floor. Moves the same way as diaphragm. So on your inhalation, they both lower, and on the exhalation, they both raise. So they're like best friends. They stick together. They lower on the inhale, and they raise up on every exhale. And this is why posture is really important, because the only way they can do that is when we're we have good posture, whether we're sitting or standing. So just 
for a moment, hold your hands there, slouch over and see the breath can't happen the same way. So this is why our posture and our breath are so linked. The lungs are expanding on the inhale and then on the exhale, they're kind of deflating or relaxing. So on the inhale is that expansion in the lungs and on the exhale is that deflating. Um, and then the air, so the air that's around us, including oxygen, gets pulled into the lungs on each inhale and then is going out on each exhale. It's forced out by this action that's happening in the body. So when we're breathing in, we all know that we're drawing in oxygen and when we're breathing out, we're releasing carbon dioxide. So that's the real basic of what's happening with the breath. And this helps us to then start to dive into, okay, what kind of breathing do I need to be doing? One other little part with that is that we can, so we have the option to breathe in, to breathe out, and then also to hold the breath. Those are kind of our three options of what we're going to do. Now we could be breathing in through the nose or the mouth. We could breathe in through the left nostril or the right nostril. We could hold after the inhale and hold after the exhale. And this is what yoga plays around with a little bit. Pranayama means breath control in Sanskrit. And so we're controlling the breath and trying to get different outcomes. So it's important to understand what all of these do to the physical body, um, to the prana body, and just our energy level and the parasympathetic nervous system. So say if we, at the beginning here, we started with a longer exhale. So if we lengthen the exhale, it has a calming effect on the body. So it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, this calm down system. It decreases our heart rate. It starts to constrict the bronchi in, in the lungs. It stimulates our digestive activity and a great way to remember this is that if we're inhaling a lot and say we're running a marathon, we don't want to be working a lot with digestion. It's not a good spot to, to work on digestion and then be able to have the end goal of digestion is elimination. That's not good while we're running a marathon. So that's the body knows these things from a long time ago. And then this triggers rest or relaxation response. So this is great to know if you're trying to get to sleep at night, you can try lengthening your exhale. Notice. And on a typical breath, a rest breath, it might be that we're breathing in for the count of one to two, the ratio of one to two. It doesn't mean inhale one, exhale two. It can be anything two to four, three to six. Start around three or four for the inhale. So let's try that now. So if we inhale for the count of three, let's start with three. We wanna make sure that this is comfortable for us. So we find our own number if that's not. So we're gonna inhale and then exhale the count of six. Great. Okay, so if you're wanting more information, and this is great for yoga teachers or yoga students or anyone who just wants to learn more, when I was in my first yoga teacher training, I started to compile this chart of breath um, in relation to the left nostril, the right nostril, and the inhale and the exhale and all of the effects that I could kind of chart. And you can get that on my shannoncrow.com website. If you search for Shannon Crow Yoga, pranayama chart or breath chart, you'll come up with this and there's a printable PDF that you're welcome to um, have. There's lots more on there. So the opposite of that extending the exhale is extending the inhale. And that's where we increase the heart rate. Uh, we stop the digestive activity. It triggers triggers our alertness and the fight or flight response so that we automatically do that when we start to get stressed. So say if you're driving in traffic and it's really stressful and you think, oh my gosh, my shoulders are up here. 
Let's try and lengthen the exhale and just let the body know, hey, no tiger chasing me, just some traffic going on. Okay, so that's that. Now I wanted to move on to belly breathing because belly breathing is something that I learned for the last 20 plus years. And it's something that I was teaching for all of my teacher training, uh, all of my teaching yoga, up until I took a course, a hypopressive course with Trista Zinn. So the hypopressive course is more public health and a really specific technique. It's not something that most yoga teachers take, but it's my enthusiasm about public health that made me want to take that. So just know that in my own personal life, I was teaching it and then had to look at all of my thoughts around belly breathing. And this stuff that we just went over, what happens on the inhale and the exhale, really helped me to root and ground in what's physically going on in the body. And then also I experienced it in my own practice. So, uh, <clears throat> so also with that, pelvic floor physiotherapists or physiotherapists talk about the benefits of belly breathing and so do yoga teachers. So anywhere you look online, you're going to hear about great benefits to belly breathing. And I think... The thing to remember today is it's not like, oh, that thing's good for me. And so even more is better. That's, that's kind of what we're looking at with that. So if you're interested in learning more about the hypopressive technique or belly breathing, I'm going to have Trista Zinn talking on our podcast soon in the spring. Um, and that's where I really started to question what I already had as my beliefs I found a little more balance in my own practice and I stopped teaching belly breathing in my classes. So I'll, I'll show you today what I do teach and why. And I'm still learning. So if you have some more things that you know about belly breathing or just how the breath works or your own experience with this, I would love to hear in the comments. Uh, so as I said before, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor move together. So as far as a benefit, when we're breathing with really good posture, we're improving and maintaining that core function. So the core four. And when we talk about the core four, we're not talking about six pack abs. <laughs> Sorry. It's all about, so we talk about the pelvic floor, the diaphragm, the multifidus muscles at the back, and then the transverse abdominus muscles, those hugging in muscles at the side. Those are your four core main things of the trunk of the body that really is your true core. Um, we'll go into that a little bit more because we talk about March the 6th, we're going to talk about anatomy of the pelvis and then March the 13th, introduction to pelvic health yoga. And I'll talk more about that for sure. And it'll also be on the podcast. So we breathe into the lungs. We don't breathe into the belly. And so often I was cueing students, breathe into your belly, which now, um, it was Amanda who brought to my attention that she says, Amanda's a great yoga teacher in Owen Sound, Ontario, uh, Amanda Erickson, uh, she tells students to do a whole body breath instead of belly breathing. So if you imagine this canister, and we did it with the ribcage breath, where we're really inhaling to the back, the sides, the front, everywhere into this canister, and then on the exhale, it's relaxing. This is getting into your true core. Um, when the lungs fill, what happens is the abdominal organs actually move down a little bit. And that's where we see the belly does start to expand. It will happen. So let's try that. So we expand the ribs. And I have kind of, I notice now, I don't breathe as much at the belly. I've worked at expanding my ribs, going to that limit, and then exhaling. But you might notice then the belly starts to expand. So what's happening is the abdominal muscles are pressing down and they're pressing down onto the pelvic floor. So there, if there are any previous issues or any issues at all with pelvic floor health or pelvic floor uh, core function, that's gonna possibly make it worse. So, the next point I want to make is that the ribcage breath is really a healthy practice. 
Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more with uh, Kim Vopney is going to be on the podcast and she's going to talk about core breath and how it affects the core and she'll go through that with us. So that's exciting as well. If you can tell, I'm really passionate about it. So I have it's tipped a little bit that I have some experts coming on. Um, and then also, if you're rushing to take notes on this, know that there's a whole article I'm going to post in the comments so you don't have to take any notes. It's all there. Um, we're all doing diaphragmatic breathing. So sometimes some yoga teachers refer to belly breathing as diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing means that we're breathing with our diaphragm. And unless the diaphragm is paralyzed in some way, we're all breathing with the diaphragm. So it can be confusing. It could be confusing to yoga students if you're calling belly breathing diaphragmatic breathing. I don't use the term diaphragmatic breathing in my class because it seems like I'm talking about the same thing, using your diaphragm and breathing, which we're doing all the time. It can also be confusing to yoga teachers. So I don't teach that in any of my teacher trainings anymore. And then it can be confusing to the body. So let's just imagine what happens here if we're, ta if we're talking about diaphragmatic breathing, and there's a great video on this by Leslie Kamenoff, I'll try and remember to put the link in the show notes as well, that goes more into depth with this. He talks about different practices that yoga teachers have done. So we want to use the diaphragm, and the body knows that instinctively. Okay, I'm going to use my diaphragm, diaphragm when I'm breathing, but if we were only focusing on the belly breathing, it's holding it back a little bit from moving. So let's try it with the rib cage. Let's see if we can try it. Just experiment with it a little moment. So we are, we'll do one that is the rib cage breath, which is really beneficial for us. So we're going to breathe in, hold the ribs on the inhale. We breathe in. Notice that they expand and on the exhale, notice that they go back towards each other the rib cage relaxes. Now try and not move the rib cage. So this is this is not something I would normally teach, but I want you to get the idea of what it feels like. So this is something I never teach in my class, but it is something that you will bump into in yoga teacher training. So it's going to be a little harder for me. We can contract the muscles of the ribs so that they're not expanding out and then inhale in the belly. I hardly get any air. My body's very confused when I do it. Your experience might be different, but if I stick with this rib cage breath, inhale, expand the ribs, exhale, let the ribs go down. And I'm not, you know, the belly might expand a little bit. And then that's when I know, okay, that's the full extension of that breath. And then it'll relax. I hope that's making it clearer. But it's confusing to the body because the body knows, hey, the inhalation involves the rib cage moving, but we can actually override it with the brain. And that's where it's confusing. And it can happen that people are not breathing with their rib cage. So this is a good little test. Tomorrow's a holiday. It's family day. Maybe you can <laughs> ask your family if their ribs move when they're breathing and find out if anyone doesn't. Um, I work one-on-one -on -one with people who have a difficult time finding this and sometimes then just getting them to hold on to the ribs brings a lot more awareness to that. Okay. More isn't better. That's a big point that I want to get. So for instance, breathing, 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 breathing in, breathing in, breathing in. We know that breathing in and breathing out is he healthy for us. It doesn't mean that the more air we take in, the better we're going to be, especially when it comes to pelvic floor health. Uh, and we're all unique. So there might be some of you who have perfectly functioning core unit and you have developed this way of breathing that's using the ribs and also you feel a little breath going into the belly part of the body, like the bottom of the lungs, and it's really working for you and maybe you already work with pelvic floor physio or someone who's really educated in breath and you feel like you've got it. So if that's the case, know that we're all unique and I'm sharing what I've learned and what I share with my students. 
Okay, so another good example of more is not better. There's a practice in yoga called Mula Bandha or the root lock. And holding this can stimulate the pelvic floor and engage the pelvic floor a little bit, which might be beneficial. Um, we'll get into more details of that in the pelvic health introduction that I do on March the 13th. But holding that for an entire class, which is done in some yoga practices or encouraged, can cause constipation after class and pelvic floor dysfunction. So more is not better. Mula Bandha is meant to be used and then released. It's just like, let's take a, a little example here. Let's tighten our biceps, tighten these muscles of the arm, the upper arm, tighten and tighten and hold. Now, if I told you, okay, that's good for your muscles and you're using those muscles, you know that that's great, but so is relaxing them. So we need to remember this. Uh, it would not be good to hold it all day. All right. So also another great note to know is that pressure from the breath coming in is going to go to the weakest place. Now this also applies to crunches, uh, really hard abdominal work, uh, sit-ups, planks. There's a big list. I'll go into more of this with the pelvic health introduction, but we're going to go into it with breath today. So if we take a deep breath in, that pressure needs to go somewhere. So the lungs are expanding and filling, the, the abdominal organs are moving down, and they have a few places that they can go. They, it, the pressure could go to the spine, it could go to the abdomen, or it can go to the pelvic floor. Not very often would it go to the sides. We're pretty covered there. So you might see uh, spinal injuries. This is why a lot of people are saying no more sit-ups at all, ever. Very hard on the spine. The military actually uh, stopped allowing them, stopped teaching them, stopped doing them because of this reason. Also, the abdomen, you might see a hernia, and with pelvic floor, you might see pelvic floor issues, which are really common in women, pelvic organ prolapse. So the, the organs in the abdomen prolapsing. So if you, if I were to think of an analogy, if you think of a tube of toothpaste and you squeeze it, that has to go somewhere, that pressure has to go somewhere. And how would you know if you had a weak pelvic floor or if your pelvic floor was too tight, which is actually uh, more common? You would only know by going to a pelvic floor physiotherapist. So I really recommend that. Anyone that I work with in doing the hypopressive technique, I insist that they've seen a pelvic floor physiotherapist before we start playing around with the breath and seeing what they need. Um, so as I said, I'm not teaching belly breath now. I don't practice it in my own yoga practice. It's been a difficult journey for sure. I'll share the article on that. And there's lots of great comments, so feel free to add your comments as well. I do teach the hypopressive technique. Um, and we'll go into that a little more in the podcast with Trista Zinn, who teaches it. She's the only Canadian um, person who teaches the technique. She teaches it around the world, but she's Canadian. Uh, I think that's it, you guys. If you have any questions at all about breathing, breath, pelvic health, I am more than happy to answer questions if I can. And if I can't answer questions, I like to find someone who can. <laughs> Next week, we're going to talk to yoga teachers about defining your niche. Um, and as you can tell, mine is really pelvic health yoga. Uh, how to kind of set yourself apart as a yoga teacher. And I hope all of you guys are enjoying the, the sunshine here in Ontario anyway. It's sunny and I look forward to chatting with you soon. Also, if you're not already on the list to come to the, the live show for the podcast launch party, you can find that anywhere. Let me know if you can't find it online. If you go to the Connected Yoga Teacher page, you'll find it. And it's going to be lots of fun. And I'm excited. It's March the 4th at 10 a.m. And we're going to um, have a little party because the podcast will now be launched. 
Okay, take care, you guys. Namaste.